this material I'm giving you is just by way of introduction. And as that's been handed out, this section has to do with what, what's to be. Well, we can share. Now, when I first read that, I thought, I got a lot of bees. But I knew that isn't what he meant. And a lot of the emphasis of this weekend on disciplizing and mentoring, the model, the message, in light of ministry, and how already it was mentioned last night, and Steve's been preaching on this, that there's different ways of disciplizing. There's many methods, okay? There's a lot that I'm sorry. Uh, these, are, these little notes are something that came out of my peanut brain. Nothing profound. There may be some terms in there that you might not know, but don't choke on them. Or choke on them, but don't get mad at it. I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay. No big deal. Uh, I graduated from Bible College. I taught for a little while. I taught a lot of, of the years to the church ministry. Uh, or tried. And I was given a lot of discipleship material from AGC, Baptist, Mid-Baptist Press, uh, others who've done things, and all, all good stuff. Most of it was six-week, 13-week course. And my wife prompted me one day, you know, that I should do something different, get into something different, and had been still on the mind a long time. I saw the need out there, because there's this idea, and I'm all for Bible college, if it's a good school. I, I do honestly struggle, if I might say so, and I, 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 I Stephen said I had freedom too. Dr. Pop gave me freedom, so he's what he, I got, I got freedom. But in this sense, I struggle with the, the mentality out there in Bible colleges today that have teachers are all different theological persuasions, and the student comes, and they're throwing all these things to choose from. <coughs> That's not mentoring. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul says to Timothy, his representative, as he was going to depart from this life, having finished his course, that he would carry out in the care of the churches, not, not just so much as a pastor, but as an overseer, that he wanted him to reproduce men who were teachable, who in turn could to teach others. What? The things that Paul had committed to him, which was revelation. And the word others is heteros, accused of the plural, but it means others who are individual people who had a different point of view than Paul had at that time because they were where Paul was. And part of mentoring and discipleship is not dictatorship, but if I'm going to mentor you, I'm going to pull you with my perspective on things, and you are going to have the freedom to analyze it. At the, and when you analyze it, you can choose. But you're going to have to prove to me, and you're going to have to sell me that your view is better than the one I've got in light of my understanding. Yeah. Until you can do that, you're not going to have that liberty to toss it around and teach it. Yeah. That's not dictatorship. That's mentoring. Can you see the Apostle Paul say, Timothy, I'm going to throw all this stuff out here and different views on regeneration, different views on soteriology, different views on eschatology and all this stuff, and you just take your pick. He did hard. He says, mimic me. Imitate, mimic me, and what? Perspective. Divine perspective. Biblical revelation. With your individual personalities. Do you know God only made one nuke? And he told me he's faithful. And <laughs> we're faithful. <laughs> and he only made one you close. And my wife's thankful. <laughs> and I'm thankful. <laughs> and the church is thankful. <laughs> and I'm so thankful there's only one Stephen Claw. How can you handle two of him? <laughs> this is precious though. God has made us uniquely in his image, but with footprints and DNAs that's special to ourselves by divine decree. And out of that uniqueness comes a commonality of perspective through mentoring. So, in a lot of Bible colleges, sometimes you go and you come out worse than when you went. 
or less convinced of what you thought you believed because there's so many views out there. I think you ought to study them all in a process of time, or what you can. But know what you believe and why as you analyze them, the divine part of you. So I looked out there. This is a long introduction, isn't it? But this is, this is the material I'm giving you and where I'm going. It comes out of this thought pattern that I saw in God's people in local congregations, all different ages, a big gap between those who are in Bible school and those who never went. The pastor has knows it all, no one else knows anything much. Or those who go through the preliminary 13-week courses, which are excellent and necessary, then they, they drop them. I hope they make it. <laughs> and as I flew around this in my head, I took on a fellow who saved about three or four days at Corona Catholic background. Steeped in punk rock music and a thousand rock records. <laughs> I didn't even touch it. I didn't even condemn it. See, Dr. Clark had a statement that he just threw up my head all the time. He just set yourself with the word. Set. Did he even say that here? Mm -hmm. Set yourself with the word. Pardon? I get, I'm getting, I mean, this is the beauty of a wife. They love to quote you. Anyway, notwithstanding that philosophy, <laughs> I believe that you pour the word on people, the Spirit of God will take that, and the Spirit of God will bring them to where they're to go. I can't do it, but I can do this. I can pour it on. And I'm pouring it on. I'm an example of what can happen. I haven't made it yet. I'm still in progress. progress process. <laughs> I'm a cleric personality. You can't tell that, can you? Do you know what clerics do? They fly off the hand quick. You know, James says, wash the tongue. Got to be careful. I'm better than I was. The space between is much longer. <laughs> but if I get in the right circumstances, still it can happen. You know what I got to do with that? Take care of it real quick. <laughs> destroy people's lives. So anyways, the saturation of the word has a tendency to bring people to convictions <clears throat> in their lives. So I took Bob Potma for four years. And I struggled as to what to do. There's no material out there, unless you go to the classroom. So I struggled and played around and so forth. And I, I just put these two a few thoughts together over the years that I would use to develop what well, lay theologians we call it. I don't want to turn it up. Where a person can get to know better what they believe and why they believe it from Genesis to Revelation. From Genesis to Revelation. Do you believe all 66 books in the Bible are God breathed? Amen. 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 And the word God breathed, the Anustas, literally means God's the source and He created it. When you attack the word, you attack God. You attack the character of God. Amen. And you can't know God without the word. You cannot know God without the word. Jesus says in John, the opening discourse, to His 11 disciples, if you love me, you will pay record. Well, present tense, keep on guarding my commandments. That's revelation. That means by lifestyle, by understanding, be a polemic if you have to be, be an apologetic if you have to be, be a exhortationist if you have to be, be a communicator, a live the life, all that goes together in light of keeping our love for Him. If I don't love my Lord, I gotta walk in the truth that I know. Anything less says I don't love my Lord. That's it. But the, uh, the latter part of that verse is so great. Says, and if you do that, I and the Father will uniquely, I can't explain this, make ourselves intimately known to you. Wow. That's not existential. That's divinable. But it's real. Experiential. <coughs> it's real, but I can't explain it all. But it happens. I know my Lord is real because I go by the book. Mm -hmm. And so I developed these thoughts in line of this great need I thought. I could go to, you mentioned this last night, Rick. I open the book and I look at it, I don't know where I'm at, but there's some truth I could get out of it. And that's good. Right? Devotion. Quiet time. But I could 
go to the Bible and I, oh, man, that's good. But I was always lost as where it came from, where it was going. And so I believe the big picture is one of the keys. Eternity past to eternity future. From Genesis chapter 1 to the Revelation 22, you develop the big picture. And the better you see the big picture, the details should never, never contradict the big picture. Never. For instance, to teach that you can be saved and lost is not understanding the big picture relative to the character of God. Through the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, in regeneration. Do you know what regeneration is? It's the bestowal of eternal life with a new life. God does it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, one plant and one water. And then the imperfect tense is used, which simply means action keeping going on in the past. Ongoing. And only God can give the increase. Great! If he does it, he's sovereign, he's immutable, he can't take it away. It's his life. There's the cure. So the big picture is blurred on those who teach that. Blurred. And so what I've tried to do is to present some ideas over a three-year period where I take a man in my home. No matter what age they are, no matter what background, what education, I don't care. We have coffee. I'm a great cook. I buy peanuts. <laughs> salted. In case you don't like it, not salted. This might sound mundane, but I love them in my home. Do you know why? They see me on my good days. I don't have very many. They see me on bad days. My ups and downs, my stress, my worries, my fears. My wife's had two or three major surgeries with, a, with the big C. I don't want to dwell on it. But there's, there's stress there. I don't want to lose my wife. It's out of my control. Then I get frustrated with God's people. They don't get frustrated with me because I've arrived. No, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know? All that is real life. Then I look at the environment, the landscape of what's going on out there, and that bothers me and I struggle. And they see me in that <clears throat> mode. And they see me laugh. They see me cry. We pray together over something with tears come down our eyes. There's been, there's been collapses within the family that breaks your heart. And you cry. That's the real world. But Paul calls it the good fight. I hate fighting, but I gotta fight. But the, the spirit of God's hell. And so that culture of trying to train someone over a period of time is more realistic. And I've been blessed with some who've gone on to Bible college and they're pastoring now. I know this, this guy here, Bob Palma. I'm going to use an example. I've got to give you two notes here. He was steeped in rock music. After one year of playing tennis, <laughs> teaching in my home, serving them burners ginger ale, my wife would buy, make lemon. Moran pie, he helped me eat the whole thing. Talk about a challenge to your spiritual life. I love that stuff. And he just gobbled us down. You gotta see him today. <coughs> I just saw my wild dogs, Bob. <laughs> Over that pro do you know what he would do when we first met? We played tennis, he'd lose a point, he had this beautiful racket. It goes about as high as you can see it. And he he tried to catch it, you know, it had to come down, broke the handle. I'm sitting there, brother. <laughs> Give me a break. You stay with it. He came over a background, theologic, Roman Catholic. His brothers aren't saved, his family's not saved, nice people, but he didn't know where, he really didn't know. But because of saturation of the word over a process of time, now you can tell that I'm enthused about this because it works, Amen. but it costs, it costs. Mm -hmm. I got a teeth tonight when I don't feel like it. I'm tired and I'm bored and I had a bad day. <laughs> and I don't need that guy to come to my house. I need rest. My wife's been mad at me because I've been stupid. She, I made a frustrator here. And I don't need that neither tonight. <laughs> ah, but when they get there, he encourages you and they encourage them. It's this great stuff. He came one day to my house and he said, I have a bonfire. This is literally true. He had thousands of dollars of this, these records. Revolutionary. Punk. Garbage. I didn't say that to him. 
I do now, because we're, we can we understand that. I let the Spirit of God take care of it, okay? Mm. Do you know that revolutionary music has no solution to it? They always tell you about how bad it all is and how we got to change, but they never tell you how. <laughs> Just chaos. Anyways, <laughs> I mean, this is all an introduction, but this is his part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't pass them on. He didn't trade them in to get some money. Mm. He burnt them all. Mm. As, he, as he had a ha bad habit of drinking big large bottles of coke. No. He burnt them all. His tennis game, guess what? That racket started to go up less and less. <laughs> I didn't say, if you don't go throw that racket, I'm going to leave. I felt like it. <laughs> but. The Spirit of God took the Word of God over a process of time. This guy went to Bible college. He got five awards. One was in Greek exegesis. Wow. He got went back and took a postgrad course in Hebrew. Now, not everybody's like this. Don't get me wrong. I don't care. God does it. I had no idea. When I saw that guy down the street got saved and I had him in my yard, I had no idea what I was getting into and where I was going for sure. I'm just an average person that worked in a body shop, mm -hmm. in a textile factory. And I caught a little bit. And I played hockey and played around in sports a little bit. And I raised a family. And I put bread and butter and margin on the table. And things like that. Just average people. I've only got grade 9 and a half a grade 9 education. But the Spirit of God can take the word of God in our lives and do beyond what we think and a lot of understanding of it because it's spirit origin and directed. Bob and I was pastoring. This song before I came up. Five little kids holding the line, strong convictions over a process of time. I have others that as when you been with me started out for three years and they got moved away in a year and a half and at that point in time they, they're a lot better off than they when they started. But one thing is, I had a Chinese fellow, he's a pharmacist. His testimony, okay, this is a real thing. His name is Hugh Wong. My name is spelled H-U-G-H. His Hugh is spelled H-I-U. Am I right? H-U-I. Are you sure? I think, I, I think you're wrong because H-U sounds close like, you tell me. <laughs> anyway, I was wondering if H U I sounds, you know, I'm H U. Then I found out oh, Hugh says that's wrong. It's H I U. I don't know how they get U out of H I U, do you? That's it. His name's Wong. He was safe for a number of years. He came up to me in the pharmacy and I was there. He said, Would you disciple me? Out of nowhere, the word got around. Oh. Wow. And I said, um, uh, uh, well, you know, I, I hesitate, I do it, I, I, I fear, I'm shy, I don't know what to do, I'm not sure if I can handle this, I'm sure and all that kind of stuff, you've been there? I said, and then I said, I will if you'll let me do it my way. Now that sounds egotistical, but I, I have to be had to come on my terms. He said, yes. Yeah. Hugh Wong would not even speak from the Bible or talk about it in public. No. C O N F I D E N C E. No confidence. Now, confidence and pride are two different things. Absolutely. Okay. I had for three years. I was three years using this approach. Number one, confidence came. His wife was ahead of him. Very talented. He, this guy's great, but by the way, he stumped me more times. Like, He's what? Stumped me in a lot of questions. Oh. I hate this guy. I hate this. <laughs> and he speaks with that kind of broken dialect, you know, I got to listen to him real close because I miss it. And he became, out of, from what was a shell of a man in timidity, to a person that got into leadership, who had some Bible study classes going on, because he's got confidence. And one of the things I see developing is confidence at whatever level from that. And he, he, he's, he, he took some courses at Heresies and night courses. 
And uh, he, he, he told me some stuff he wrote out. I got it in my, in my own office. I could do things like that. I only grade eight education. He's got a university education. Who cares? Doesn't matter. The authority is not me, it's the word, right? And so, also, he started to see the big picture, so the confidence came so that in detail, and we don't have every detail correct, but we have it more than we do before. And I don't know everything in the Bible and say that I understand it completely. There's some tough stuff there. But as you see the big picture, you start to see it clearly more often than you did before. And you have the big view of life, which is eschatological. And so what I've given you this morning, I'm going to touch on it briefly, is just some of the things I developed that, I, that helped me do this in the home. Do you mind just going through that with me just a little bit? Okay. I know that's a long introduction, but, but it doesn't, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a philosophy, okay? And there's other ways you can do it. But this is work. And these guys uh, can handle the work a lot better than they've ever been able to do to get to the Greek because they're doing the process. On page number one, just look at it quickly there. Uh, you know, the top part there, it says, The just shall live by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And without this type of faith, it's impossible to please God. The just shall live out of faith. What faith? Everybody lives by faith. Do you know that? Everybody, I lived by faith before I knew the Lord. I lived by faith in my own abilities, whatever they were, or I thought they were. Everybody lives by faith. Why does God, the sovereign creator, who in Genesis chapter 1 says, Elohim, noun, plural, used uniquely in the Hebrew language, says, and Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And all that is there in In the beginning, John 1 says, in the arcade, the in there is the imperfect tense. The word in line of the particle position means it's emphatic. In the beginning was the word. And all things were made by him. Now, in the Hebrew language, two direct opposites like that, heaven and earth, speaks of totality. He did it all! It didn't evolve. Well, God says, this one who says, he created us, and his only name says, the just shall live out of a different type of faith perspective. Number one, it's not this way. It's not this way. It's not subjective. It's not what I feel or think that counts. It's what he says that counts. The just shall live out of faith, and then God says what that faith comes from. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. Very important principle. <coughs> okay? And I just did a summary thought on quickly on what the Bible is like. And it's amazing. Uh, Let's just go down the aisles and, and do one. We're not going to look at the references. Uh, the value of the word. The word is what? Rick, can you read that one? Can you see that one at all there? Oh, I'm truth. Yeah, the word is truth. The next, next one says the word is what? <coughs> Your wife can say it. Sanctifies. The word sanctifies or sets apart. All right? The word what? Saves. Saves. The word what to the saints? Renewed. Renewed. The word washes the saint. The word keeps the saint. The word grows the saint. The word is the divine origin. The word transcends experience. The word brings new birth. The word is eternal and trustworthy. The word is the sword of the spirit. The word is on par with the name or the character of God because he's the author of it. And that's just a smidgen. You ever read Psalm 119? <laughs> Unbelievable. What I do with these students is I have I sign readings, and we do a public reading at first. And I start off with this read Psalm 119 each time, you know, section on that. Just for emphasis. The psalmist on the word. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay. Page two. I, I call these certain keys to understand in the word. These aren't anything phenomenal, but I found this is what came out of my mind as I tried to struggle with over the years. There's a key verse that helps motivate us. 2 Timothy 2.15. How many know it? My mentor, the very first time I sat down in that class, he goes, no, he says, 
see this? Study. Be diligent. To show yourself what? <laughs> Approved unto God. That's the mentor. To help mentor the disciple. You don't disciple people if you haven't been mentored at a certain level. Or you're going to both go down heretical roads. Right? He says, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. A pleasant puzzle. Keep on. It's a process to keep on rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, when it says approved unto God, it not only looks at now in time, but what, where, where is the believer going to uh, uh, go when he first uh, he leaves his body and then at his return, at the rapture? Where do we go? What happens to us? We appear before the famous seat of our Lord, one on one. That's in view here. This scares me. Because when I get before the famous seat, there will be a certain review in his gracious way. Did I really try? He didn't talk about perfection here. It doesn't mean that you have to be equal in where we're at. It doesn't mean that at all. It means where we're at, though, and the effort given has to be within this context. That you don't handle the word sloppily. It's his work, and he at that day will look at our works and how we handle one of the things in the word, I believe. Did Jesus say, well, it doesn't really matter, I'll just throw that out and hope it's okay? No, he didn't say we wouldn't make mistakes. He didn't say that I wouldn't trip something wrong. That it won't be purposefully. You follow me? And that's okay. But if I, if I get sloppy and don't care and just do it, that's bad. And so to be approved of the ground means I'm going to have to yeah, study and to handle the word. Okay? Some key principles. This is terrible. Hermeneutics is awfully important to teach your student. That is how you interpret things. Now, if you take a newspaper and you read it, you interpret it by exactly what they're trying to say in that article. Do you not? And do you know most articles are about a grade four level, they say? I don't know if that's true or not. That's about the height of the... But we take it in fact of what they say and try to understand it. Any book you read, you try to get what they say and understand it, right? But why in the world would it come to the book of books that we don't do that? Well, there's some secret spiritual message in here I got. It just came to me. Man, the lights came on. Did you know? It's out of context. It's out of exactly what the word means. And they dispense with exhortation on something that is completely devoid of what the text is trying to talk about. The only book they do that consistently with, and spiritual leaders on TV do it all the time. Amen. Oh, man, what terrible stuff. So Amen. we are free to do that if we're going to rightly divide the word of truth. I have one student of mine that says, the different kind of hermeneutics, eh? There's the literal, historical, grammatical method, or normal method of interpretation. Just common sense. Okay, let's read. My passing, my mentor just kept on that with me. I have Bobby Fallowfield, I taught him, and he, he says, you, he says, guess what I've had today, the pastor spoke, oh, we've got to be careful, because I don't want to be critical, but he said, man, did we have a great message based on application hermeneutics. Did you ever hear that? That's a new one. Application hermeneutics? Application hermeneutics, what do you mean is, it was application, 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 but not at the expense of the text. The text wasn't even talking about it. Period. I mean, he's a, he, he has a new method of hermeneutics. He says, I got a new one. Application of hermeneutics. Oh, it's legitimate or because. But there is the allegorical method of interpretation. There are those who spiritualize everything. Do you know what that does? That leads us to our own whims. And God is not so unwise to let us do that because we can't handle it. You leave me to t interpret the Bible with any way I want and don't care. Believe me, guess what I'm going to teach you guys? <laughs> Heresy. <laughs> myself too. <laughs> and God says, you don't agree so hardly. <laughs> but, God, but God says, I don't trust my word to you that way. I trust my word to you on the basis of my perspective. 
my way. So hermeneutics or method of interpretation is very important. Mm -hmm. Some interpret all the Bible except prophecy literally or normally. When it comes to prophecy, it's all allegorical. Someone said to me not too long ago, it doesn't matter whether you're all male, pre-male, post-male, or whatever. As long as you believe the Lord's coming and it changes your life. Oh. Don't you think about that? <laughs> Don't tell him I said it. <laughs> but that's so terrible. When this man is pre-male, I'll preach it. Okay? But it doesn't really matter where you, as long as the, the fact that you know the Lord's coming changes your life. That's an overstatement. By far. Because what? The emphasis is on the person of the book before it's on the revelation of the person of the book. And the revelation of the person of the book comes first, so we understand his perspective and mindset all the way through. <coughs> Can I throw another one to you? I got to 12 o'clock. We're okay. What is that? This is, the, this is just fun time. We're okay, okay. Amen. <laughs> Someone told me that we don't need more theologians. We need more people to live theologically. Did you get that? I don't. How can you live theologically if you are theologically orientated? We need both. There's no word in the Bible that says you're supposed to be theologically oriented and not live that way. That's heretical. Um, there's another hermeneutic. I'm just going to mention it to you for fun. It's called complementary hermeneutics. What does that mean? How many know what that means? Now see, this is you're going to choke on this and think, uh -huh. don't, don't worry about it. It's okay. Complementary hermeneutics is that method of hermeneutics that says that the New Testament complements the old in light of interpretation, but it does it at the expense of the old. So that complementary will take some new truths here, as they see it, put it back on the Old Testament context, and change it all so that it doesn't mean what it said back there anymore. That's grown like crazy to progressive dispensationalism. So what's that? Doesn't matter. It's out there. <laughs> okay, number three. The key focus of Old Testament scriptures. You're not bored, are you? No. no. Only a few said I've had it. <laughs> <laughs> this is all just concepts to give to you, okay? The, the key focus of the Old Testament scriptures. Is this important to understand the whole? More than you think. <laughs> the Old Testament scriptures saw the suffering Messiah and the glory of the Messiah. They saw the cross and they saw the crown. But what they did not see was the body of Christ. Not even the angels knew about it. If you mix that up, you're in trouble. So I spent time on that for the big picture. A key overview of the scriptures is like with the idea of two bookends. Genesis chapter 1 says that in the beginning God created Elohim, the heavens and the earth. And he saw that it was what? Good. You come to Revelation chapter 21 and he says, And I saw a new heavens and a new earth through John the Beloved. And the former heavens will pass away. And all things become kainos, new and kind. What happened? God said it was good. Why did it have to pass away? Why did there have to be something new? Those are the two bookends. And you want to see what's in between them. There's something's happened. It's affected life. I used to have a lot of hair. <laughs> Something's happened. This is disastrous. <laughs> I never had as many wrinkles. I'm getting older. I'm 65 going on 90. <laughs> it shouldn't be this way. You don't look so hot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you see, between those two bookends, some dramatic things have happened. So you've got to go to eternity past, to eternity future, future and watch things develop through the book. Okay? Genesis is the book of commencement, beginning in Revelation is the book of consummation. 
You can't understand Revelation without Genesis. You can't understand Revelation without Daniel. You can't understand Revelation without the Olivet Discourse. You can't understand Revelation without understanding Daniel chapter 9 specifically. Impossible. But guess what? You can. You can! I don't care where you've been. High school, public school, high school, university, or never gone nowhere. With a mentor, you can! Because the Spirit directed. Key vision I touch on. Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11. The only kind of people on planet Earth is what? Gentiles. There's no Jews can be found there. There's no church can be found there. So you start to see ethnos, the Gentile nations. Ah, oh, but in Genesis chapter 12, something changes. We have the Jewish family coming on the scene to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> Stephen, in his great message, as he was about to be martyred, he gave a tremendous expose of the unfolding of the Old Testament scriptures. He says, and the God of glory appeared unto Abraham. Where? Not when he met Isaac only and it was counted unto him for righteousness before that. Before even Genesis chapter 15. He appeared to Abraham, and we don't have much detail, but Abraham, no doubt, was just a pagan. Gentile. His father remained a Gentile. See, God sovereignly chose Abraham and revealed himself to him and started a family that would become a nation called the nation Israel. And by the way, the church is never called Israel. Nowhere. And even when they say the Israel of God and the church is always talking about in a Jewish race, the individual, the bloodline. Always. That's important. I know I'm going fast. But you're enjoying it. I can tell. <laughs> then we have the beginning of the law. If you put your hands in your Bible, I'm going to do this for fun. I do this, but this is, this is the orientation. I, if I put my hands in the Bible to Exodus chapter, let's go to Exodus 19, okay, just for fun. If I put my hands in my Bible in Exodus 19, just as a starting point, and I go, I go through the Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew 27, verse 51, it says, In the veil, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two at the crucifixion. Now, you hold your Bible up just for fun. Picture's worth a thousand words. This doesn't seem very significant, but it's a key step in understanding the whole and helping the average person. So all scripture is God's read and it's profitable, but within that, we've got to have interpretation that's correct. So orientation is helpful. From Exodus 19 through to Matthew 27, basically, everything you read there has to do with the nation Israel predominantly, and the Gentile nations surrounding them, and the dispensation or the law period. Do you know the Gospels, as far as the events in the Gospel, was all under what? Law. law. No, no, that's okay, Rick. When you read the Gospel, written after the law, but the events of our Lord's ministry, our Lord lived in, under what dispensation? Law. Most people say because this is the New Testament, this is the church. No, no, the church didn't come into existence till when? Pentecost. Where was the Lord? The right hand of the Father. And so orientation, I know I don't have to worry about the church there. I don't have to worry about grace. There's grace there, but it's not the dispensation of grace. I know that the instruction has to do with a people, in a land, in a city, in a temple, and all the things that are related to that. So I don't have to worry about, I don't the church is not, there's application, pure. This is an example, so I'm orientated. When I come to Genesis 1 through 11, guess who I don't even think about? I don't think about the church, not initially. I don't think about the nation Israel, initially. I know it was given to them. I know that the instruction there was dealing with Gentile people. It helps you eliminate some things, right? And so the um, 
what I try to do is get them orientated and on the whole so that they can go in deeper without being worried and all mixed up. Okay. The key books of the Bible. Now, yes, Dean? Did I say Matthew 21? Oh, I told you. Thank you. Matthew 27. I apologize. See, communication. I told you. I haven't arrived yet. <laughs> Matthew 27, okay? Now, the key books of the Bible. I thought all the Bible was key. Do you believe all the Bible are important? Yes. But on understanding the big picture, these are probably, but my mentor taught me this, so I just withdrew what he said. He emphasized these books to me as the helps to get the big picture quicker. Not at the expense of the other ones, we're not saying that. But you've got to have, understand Genesis. You've got to understand Exodus and the flow there. You've got to understand Deuteronomy because primarily of the reiteration of the law but the Palestinian covenant. You've got to understand Joshua because they're moving into what? The land promised to them, okay? And first and second Samuel he mentioned as king because you've got the first king Saul, the second king David with the Davidic covenant coming into play. But it's movement here, it's movement here, okay? Isaiah is important. Daniel is a must. Matthew, Acts, Romans, Hebrews, and Revelation. Now, as you get to know and orientate to those books, basically, you start to develop the big picture rather quickly. Okay? Key subjects that you should be orientated to. I know I'm going fast. Angels, Gentiles, Israel, the nation, the body of Christ. Covenants. Another key to understand in the whole, and it takes three years, is the covenant. Now, who were the covenants given to in relationship to the Mosaic, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, the Davidic, and the New Covenant? Who were they given to? The Jews. What's the difference between the Mosaic Covenant and the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, the Davidic, and the New Covenant? What's the major difference? That's right. It makes a world of difference. When you see the struggles of Israel, it has to do with their rule of God under the law relative to a land. Think of the Great Commission. And you shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, the animal parts of the... What do you mean we're told to be in the land, to conquer the land, to master the land, to be there and be blessed by God in the land? All of a sudden, directions drastically change. How come? Something new's coming on. Got to see it. Covenants are key to understand in the whole. Dispensations are unbelievably important to understand the whole. If I, one of the greatest, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to put this on briefly. I don't care if you remember it or not. One of the most insidious things ever happened to the dispensation of view of the scriptures is called uh, progressive dispensationalism that's coming on the scene real fast. I, I'm just going to introduce you to the concept, okay? Uh, well, good. Classic dispensationalism, which I believe there are seven dispensations. Make no apology for it. If you're a normative dispensationalist, means you believe law, grace, and kingdom, that's good, that's helpful. But well, pray tell me for the first 2,000 years or so, where was God? Not bothering with his creation, no stewardship, who cares? All of a sudden he gets interested. I met a man once, he said, you know, he says, oh, he says, he took me, he says, I'm sure glad to meet another seven-pointer. I haven't seen him for a long time. All I'm saying is, classic dispensation is they must understand the whole. I believe with all my heart. I don't apologize for it. I don't even care if you disagree. Oh, I do care if you disagree, sir. That's not going to stop me. Because I know it opens up to scripture. Now, what's the difference? Well, classic dispensationalism <coughs> has to do with the dispensation of law, or innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. Let's jump to progressive. Now, what's the main purpose of dispensation, classic dispensation, is the glory of God. We were made to bring glory to Him, right? 
the key, the key view of all, theology should be for the glory of God as the ultimate. Now, progressive dispensations hold to the glory of God, but their emphasis is on soteriological aspect of it, like covenant theology. Now, I know you're not going to remember, it doesn't matter. But here's the difference. Progressive dispensation says the Davidic kingdom started with Christ's earthly ministry spiritually, especially when he inaugurated it on the cross spiritually. That Jesus Christ right now, as he sits on the right hand of the Father, is governing under the Davidic covenant spiritually. Not physically, not politically, not economically, but he's already there spiritually. Where does that put... changes the historical setting. It manipulates. Now when you read Stephen's message in the New Testament, he gives new details about context in the Old, but never at the expense of it. He tells us something more about Moses I didn't see in the Old Testament, but it didn't change the Old. Complementary hermeneutics takes some stuff in the New and changes the Old to make it fit the New. It's called complementary hermeneutics. Or reinterpretation hermeneutics. You can't do that. So, so am I choking you? I don't care. It's okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It's okay. You don't, you don't understand it? Don't worry about it. It will come. <laughs> the purpose of history in light of progressive dispensationalism, which is permeating our churches and our schools, is that it's Christologically holistic, redemptive, and focused. That means it's centered around the person of Christ and what he has done in light of his provision on the cross, which is biblical, but not the glory of God. So it's therapeutic in that sense. But the main thing is, it starts to smear the distinction between Israel, and God's program from Israel, and the body of Christ. So much for that. Aren't you glad I mentioned it? Amen. Do you understand? It doesn't matter. Now, eschatons. Page number four. What's an eschaton? What's the matter? I'll just I spell it wrong. Click the oh, click the button. Oh. Now, have you ever heard this statement made? We're going pretty fast, but this is how I quote it, okay? Eschatology has the idea of things that have a future. Okay? So let's say 25% of the Bible, or, or thereabouts, or something close to that, is dealing with future things. And so that's not really important. Okay? It's, it's the, 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 the main volume of the book is the main important, eh? But that's a myth. I didn't bring it with me, but in the book of Genesis alone, you ought to see what starts that has a future to it. The eschatology of scripture means things that have a start and is woven through the whole body of truth and you can't yank them out and understand the Bible. The roots are all wound together. And you've got to see it unfold as a whole. And so they say, well, prophecy isn't important. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. Sincere as it might be. The book of Genesis starts it all. The Revelation closes it all. That's the big picture. So I spend time just not teaching a lot of, but just mentioning some things that have a start and where they start and so forth. And this isn't exhaustive, okay? Some key terms. Oh, no, not terms. What does it mean, times of the Gentiles? Never heard of it before. I don't know where it is. I asked one student who graduated from a school not too far from where I live, and I asked him, he asked me about a disciple of him. He's out of a four-year school, and, and, and he... he, 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 he Nice guy. I didn't want to teach. I said, "What can I teach you in four years of Bible college?" He said, oh. "He kept hounding me." So I said, "Well, well, we'll work together and see if we can." He didn't see the big picture. That's the whole. He couldn't bring the scriptures at all. He was just lost. But he's got a degree. Hey, back. I said, "Well, Mark, what do you think the times of the Gentiles mean?" No big question. But you had to start somewhere. Well, he says, isn't that where, isn't that the beginning of the church? Mm 
So I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> but it's not that. So I teach key terms to help understand the whole. The difference between the times of the Gentile and the fullness of the Gentile. The difference between the nation Israel and the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, I like that term better than the word church. The word church, we use it, is two great words, ek and ekklesia, call out. But that's used for a call out group of people. Then you say, what? Now, I don't want to con get to controversy here because that wouldn't be good. And I don't know where Stephen is on this. He's probably right and I'm wrong. But it does not matter. It doesn't affect the whole. But I, I, in Matthew, when he says, upon this rock, the rock there is the revelation right. that God the Father gave to Peter. It's not Peter. It's not the Lord. It's the revelation about the Lord. It's the book yeah. from the Father. I will build my church. Ecclesia. Well, that could be the body of Christ, and most hold to that. Or it might be the fact when he goes on states the rest of us, that refers to that he will, in light of his covenant, build his congregation or his nation Israel in light of the remnant, of all the tribulation here. So ecclesia can mean a number of different things, okay? Never mind, don't even touch that. <laughs> it doesn't affect the whole, Steve, it's okay. Oh, I, can have, I can have fun. But, but the word itself is vague. Ecclesia is vague in the sense that you define it where it's used. Is that not right? It can be used in a congregation. A uh, lot, lot uh, of people gather together. No spiritual connotations whatsoever. So key terms are important. Dispensation is a term. It's biblical. It's found nine times in the New Testament. Did you know that, Steve? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nine times. Then you, you go where it's used and define how it's used in the context. Mm -hmm. It basically has the idea of stewardship, but in different contexts. Power, Paul, Ephesians 3, was given the stewardship of grace, his ministry, to the Gentile. But later on in that chapter, we have that word used in relationship to the body of Christ, which was not seen before the ages in the past had never been revealed. So it's used different ways, but it's a biblical term. Okay, Jacob's trouble is the term we talk about. The throne of his glory. What does the throne of his glory refer to? Uh, you got to know, it helps the whole. The Davidic kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of grace, the everlasting gospel, are they all the same? What do you think? I'm not going to put you on the spot, but they're not. Okay? The day of Christ, the age to come, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the one new man, covenant theology, the seal of the temple, all these terms we spend time on because they help define the whole. It's a process. Are you choking? Don't worry about it. You can get it over a period of time, though. It's great stuff. That's why Stephen here has got the response. <laughs> no. But these are some of the keys I found that I, I use as I develop my disciple. And over three years, they have a, a pretty good understanding of where they're going. Amen. And, they can, and the big things you want a person to understand on their own two feet biblically. How can we say they know it all? Or we know it all, or we've arrived, but there's some kind of confidence to know where they come from, where they're going, and why. Okay? Now, in closing, I want to just touch on one thing. And we had the 12 to 11 30, I'm doing pretty good, I think. Now, if I, if I have choked you or bored you, so it's, 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 that's okay. You say, why is this important? And that's a good question, too. I'll tell you one thing it works. I'll take average people. We're all average people. I'm talking people who never went to school. All degrees of learning. In my home over a three-year period, I can get them to be oriented with confidence to know what to believe and where they're going so they can self-feed more than just devotional. And it's more than devotion. There's a Greek, there's a word in the Old Testament called meditate on thy word. Amen. You can study, you can learn, you can recite, but meditation means to what? Think on it, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a different word I use. I mentioned to Rick. I had the word stew. Sometimes my wife thinks I'm mad at her. I'm sitting there. What's the matter with you? You're quiet. I don't even know. I'm sitting there. My mind's just stewing on something in the book. It's trying to crystallize it. But that's when it becomes part of me. Amen. <laughs> Jumps off the page and becomes mine. And then I can teach with confidence. Oh. You got to work at it. Kingdom. I did this little layer of kingdom because there's such confusion there. And you may not get this. It's okay. I saw a need for it. Because there's a great emphasis on the realized kingdom right now. Some say that we are in the kingdom right now. 
I say what kingdom? <laughs> okay? This is not exhaustive and there's more to it yet, but there is the universal kingdom of God which covers God's sovereignty from eternity past to eternity future. Everything's within the bounds of that. Any freedom we have to choose is always within the bounds of the sovereignty of the universal rule of God. Only in that sense do we have freedom. Not at the expense of it, not beyond it. Impossible. It was divinely ordained before the found buildings of the world that my wife <coughs> to be king to that hot game saw those two little guys. <laughs> <laughs> little guy. I've been trying to bulk up. I work on the <laughs> this is this is serious. I got an image thing here. I work out with weights. I thought about a weight, but I thought, ah, that's cosmetic a little bit. I'm I'm only teasing I'm only I'm only teasing here. Then there's the kingdom of darkness, which comes under the realm of the universe. The kingdom of darkness, there's many terms for this is that where Satan controls and rules but within the umbrella of the sovereignty of God. He is not sovereign. But he has a kingdom. It's called the kingdom of darkness in Colossians. Contrast to the kingdom of light. So understanding the word kingdom and how it's used is important to understand the whole and keep you from being confused. Then there's the spiritual kingdom through faith through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit that began with Adam. Adam was as safe and secure as you and I are today. Christ hadn't died yet, only in the plan of God, slain before the foundations of the world. He was as firmly as secure as we are today, even though we look back at the cross. Even though he didn't have the clear focus of who was going to die on the cross. He was saved by faith and contextual revelation and regenerated by the Spirit of God in light of the enlightenment given to him at that time. And secure, nothing to separate him. Different ramifications now, different blessings, but I haven't changed. Are you okay? I'm worried about your daughter. She's... No, I'm going to you. <laughs> the spiritual kingdom refers to all saved people, if I can use that term, to space-time history. Okay? The kingdom of his dear son refers to the body of Christ, which began on the day of Pentecost and was in existence until the rapture. It wasn't there before that, and it isn't there after that, in line of the earthly scene. Now, the kingdom of his dear son involves some of the people who are in the spiritual kingdom through faith and regeneration, but not all the people. Oh, that's confusing, but that's okay. Then there's the Davidic kingdom, called the Messianic kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ, was distinct from the kingdom of his dear son. In the kingdom, the Davidic kingdom, there is some of those in the spiritual kingdom, by faith, but not all of them, because some were already in glory. Okay? And so I'm just trying to present those four and try and get them separated because in kingdom theology that's coming on the scene, it's really screwed up, really screwed up. Now, don't forget, Peter, uh, uh, Stephen said to me, uh, what's the bee? Where's the bee? Where's the bee? I say, what's the bee? <coughs> I have what's, I like it, what's the bee? My beef is that no one's taking every people and willing to sacrifice time on the bent of the deposit they've been entrusted with by God and disciple others in the whole in this way. We need always. My brother said to me many times, this guy here, he organizes everything for me. I have, I'm the worst writer. Aren't those beautiful? <laughs> Isn't that classic? Now, when he made this folder for Stephen, for me, he took all my notes. Do you ever get a phone line that's busy? What does this mean? What, what, what do you have down there? <laughs> he lost more hair. He's got more wrinkles and he struggled to take all my grubby notes and organize them so that they could look sometimes like presentable. So we're not the same. I'd be lost without him. He made me look good. <laughs> but I still wrote it down. No. <laughs> 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 
But my mentor told me that we've been deposited with truth we're accountable for. It. <clears throat> Even though I have not been around my mentor for many years, my brother and I have always felt that we were given a deposit that we were responsible for Amen. in the local ministry we were at. And this is all part of that commitment to that deposit. And that's what he did. Now, we're here to encourage you. We want you to be excited. This happened in my life after many years. I'd already had my mentor. I already spent my time, but this didn't come along too much later because of whatever. That's okay. But the goal, the heart, and so forth. And I just want to encourage you let a discipleship, even in this area, there's a great need. Amen. If you want spiritual leaders that know the book and handle the book, we need mentors to bring them along to a certain degree so that there's there for protection of others who do other things. And we can't all be in the same spot. Now, my brother never went to Bible college, but he is a weird person. Here's a kid that walks around there. He, he, if he could, he'd have a book in his hand and he'd play ball and hockey. <laughs> he even will sleep with a book on his chest, I hear. He's a bookworm. How many of you guys are bookworms? He says, I'm not. You are? Good. There's not, there, are you, your daughter, are you a bookworm? No. I'm not. I'm not. I'm really not. And so, he was always studying. I wouldn't study. Too much work. <laughs> so I went to school to be taught how to study and uh, the discipline that gave me a DRA for a long time. I wore my degree probably on my chest. <laughs> All the homework. But he didn't, he didn't go to school, but I'll tell you this much. I'll put him in any class with anybody to teach the word without apology. Why? Because he has the vision, the deposit, and he's worked hard at it. Mm. We complement one another. I've been so blessed. I've got a brother of like mine. Like looks good. <laughs> <laughs> it's unique. I'll tell you, there will be times in my life of ministry without that guy, I may not have made it. I'm not going to say I wouldn't have because I'm tenacious, but it, it was helpful. This man here, I love very much. He was a rug rat now, he's not now. <laughs> he needs more men around him to encourage and carry him. And that'll happen if they get a thirst for the book, excited about the book, and want to know the book and deposit it on people's lives. It's going to free him up. There's going to be commonality and encouragement, even when you're part. He can't last this way, and he'll burn out emotionally. I know it. That isn't God's way. If there's one, if there's just one here to be interested, to let this God deposit, I think I'll pro pro post to the scripture for you, so that you can be one who then does it to someone else in the process of all the other discipling going on, you get to see what God can do if you want to do it. But it's small. And it's hard work. Mm -hmm. I sure appreciate your patience. You are the greatest people. You let me get blow away here. <laughs> but I believe it. It does cost them. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Well, it surely has got to be one who won't spend one night a week. Just for an hour. Well, it never lasts just an hour. And, and have, have coffee with this man. He'll give you double sugar. In fact, he could probably get Luke to give you Timothy's coffee. I don't know. It could be tea, could be pop. And you can share one of those lives together. Now, there's a statement out there, and I'll close with it. Relationships are more important than anything else in the plan of God. I say relationships are very important in the plan of God, but I say that revelation is the most important thing in the plan of God. And in revelation, you build relationships. Amen. I did not have a relationship with Bob Potbaugh. I just knew a name and knew nothing about him. 
my relationship with him developed within the confines of the revelation, and we're miles apart, and we have a closeness and an encouraging effect that nothing compares to it. I have a blood relationship with this man. But my greatest relationship with this man is revelation. And this man here, I don't know him that well. He's been away from me since he's been almost a little rug rat. But I have great fellowship with the man because of revelation. And a deposit entrusted to him and to me and others. And you want energy. That's where it will come. And you'll curse the flock. And I'll love you in the Lord. And you're great people. If I never see you again, we'll see you in glory. Amen. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe in glory. Yeah. That'd be better. Absent from the body. Come with glory. I know the body of God himself. Coming up yesterday, your prayers that we appreciate. We had a Dodge Ram truck that almost took us to glory. We were coming down the road and getting pretty close. Now, I'm not this type of mystical guy. Reading, I don't read into things. I don't think Satan planned that to do that to me necessarily. I think it's just plain human error, okay? But in a sin death environment, things mm -hmm. happen, okay? And that truck driver, this great big Ram Dodge truck, Ram! Oh, man, you know how it is. Oh, power! And big wheel, <laughs> big black one too. I remember the color even. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. My wife, you know, she's been lying. She didn't even see it. God's grace is there. What happened? Well, he didn't happen. But he's coming in. He put his head down. And he came over to our side of the road. All of a sudden, there I see him coming. He looks up and he reacts too quick. And he looks up just like that. I think he's going to lose it. And no matter what would have happened, no matter what I would have done, I had nowhere to go. It would have been a broadside. That's hindsight. But my sister-in-law fellow says, oh, we're, we're in the Lord's care. No worries. <laughs> and it's true. But we appreciate your prayer. We need prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord bless you. We'll have a good day together, right? Amen. Are you excited? Amen. Aren't you glad I came? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I came. I'm glad I came. <coughs> now, as we close, I want to give something to Stephen here. Oh, there he is. This here is just, that was Steve has put a lot of time in line of type it nice and neat, Stephen. And this is only a, a thing to challenge concepts. And I'm going to give it to this very special person. And it may be useful, it may be not. He might have a better way. It does not matter. As long as the end product and goals are the same. And I'm going to give it to you in front of you. And maybe somebody will get this guy and say, hey. He didn't, he, he didn't need to look at that no word that I was about. And the other studies you go on to just come automatically. But this guy can turn me on to the Lord and study the Lord the book. To lift the Lord and be excited for the Lord, you've got to be excited about the book. Can I say that again? If you are excited about the book, you'll never get excited about the Lord. You'll never get excited about ministry. Be ho ho. Mm -hmm. What energized me is that book that was birthed me, born again. Not by incorruptible seed, but by incorruptible by what? The Word of God. How do I know I'm saved? I bet most of you know the moment you're saved, right? A lot of you, I haven't got a clue. You what? No. Do I know I'm saved? Yes. Why? The Word is there. I believe it. I don't know. Salvation is instantaneous. But in the process of revelation, I can't tell you when that took place, but it did. And I know I, whom I have believed in, and I'm calling to you him against that day. These things that I have written unto you, Paul, uh, John says, to the saints, that ye might know that ye have eternal life. Based on what? That which is written. What's that? Revelation. Lord bless you. I'm all done. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. Uh oh, 